Hi, I'm Laren. This is Knife Steel Nerds. Today we're talking about Damasteel. Damasteel is a stainless Damascus steel product made in Sweden. It was originally developed and patented by Pell Bilgren and K. Embrinsen. Bilgren worked for the steel company Aerosteel and he was looking for new uses of their powder metallurgy steel. He connected with Embrinsen, who was a bladesmith and Damascus steel maker, and they worked together on developing the technology. The original material they worked on was actually made with LMAX, a powder metallurgy stainless steel from Udahome, and 304L, a soft austenitic stainless. But by the time they released the steel uh, around 95, 96, it had their final and current combination of RWL34 and PMC27. Uh, Damasteel was unique in that it was two powders that were layered up. There's no solid steel plus the powder. Well, RWL34 is the same as ATS34 and 154CM. In fact, the name RWL stands for Robert Waldorf Loveless, also known as Bob Loveless, who famously introduced 154CM and ATS34 into the knife industry. PMC27 is a powder metallurgy version of Sandvik's 12C27, also pretty similar to AEBL. Uh, you can read more about the history of Damasteel and K. Embertson and Damascus steels in general and knife steel in my book, The Story of Knife Steel. Uh, around 2016, the RWL34 PMC27 combination was renamed DS93X. And they also have a low carbon austenitic stainless and they have some newer products with a core steel, which are called Damacore. I'm not gonna talk about Damacore in this video. I'm gonna focus on this DS93X uh, with the RWL34 and PMC27. Looking at the microstructure of Dama steel, you can tell that it's made with layers of powder because there can be sort of diffuse transitions between the two materials. Here, the RWL34 is the bright layer and the PMC27 is the dark layer in the micrograph. The RWL34 is the bright layer primarily because of its high molybdenum content that allows it to resist etching and that gives it the contrast in the Damascus. If you look closer at the microstructure, you can tell that the carbides throughout are pretty fine. Obviously the RWL34 carbides are a bit larger than the PMC27. Uh, 12C27 in fact has very fine carbides even though it's not powder metallurgy and that's because of its careful composition control. I've talked about this in older articles on AEBL. Basically these Swedish companies making steel for razors, Sandvik and Udahome, they had to work really hard on the composition design, making sure it's not too high in carbon or chromium, which would lead to large carbides. And they also had to work a lot on their processing to minimize the carbide size for razors. Uh, but because this is powder metallurgy, the carbides are fine anyway. And overall, the material looks very good from a microstructure standpoint. When it comes to heat treating, we have a lot of things to talk about. One question I've gotten frequently is about Damasteel's data sheet, which used to recommend an eight minute hold time for eighth inch material, about 3.2 millimeter, and then e increasing or decreasing one minute per 0.5 millimeter. And I did not know why they had such a short hold time. Uh, when you're dealing with very short hold times, you end up trying to hit a very narrow window and small differences in the knife size can change how the steel heat treats. So if you haven't soaked long enough, it won't come out hard enough and it won't have enough corrosion resistance. So I usually prefer to recommend longer hold times. And if you need to, you can drop the temperature by a little bit. Temperature matters more than time and things tend to level out after enough hold time. So knife makers can sometimes be afraid of grain growth and so they want to try to do minimum soak times. But when you're using a furnace and furnaces can vary, it's better just to go five or 10 degrees lower and hold for 15 to 30 minutes. And so that's what I've told people in the fast and Damasteel seemingly agrees with me because they released a new data sheet this year, which recommends a 15 minute hold time instead. Uh, that's more in line with what I would recommend and all the heat treatments I did for the studies that I'm about to show were all 15 minute hold times. 
So another change between the old and new data sheet is the cold treatment recommendation. The old data sheet said to use a cold treatment for heat treatments four and five, but the new data sheet doesn't say anything about that. It just says that deep freezing is not necessary, but completes the Martin site transformation and increases hardness. So I do not recommend skipping a cold treatment when using the 1975 degree Fahrenheit osinitize, and I'll explain why in a minute. If you use room temperature quenching, you should stick with the 1925 Fahrenheit 1050 Celsius austenitizing temperature because you'll end up with excess retained austenite otherwise and the properties will be worse. Another oddity of the data sheet is that they don't give a composite hardness for the combined Damascus material of RWL34 and PMC27. Instead, it gives tempering curves for the two separate steels, one for RWL34 and one for PMC27. Presumably, this is so that you can see what the hardness will be for the two different materials when you austenitize the combined material. However, that is not how it works. Because when you forge weld the material and forge it at high temperatures, the carbon will equalize between the two materials. It is slightly more complicated because the RWL34 will still have some carbon locked up in carbide. Not all of it will be in solution. But the carbon that is in solution for the two materials will equalize. This is because carbon is a very tiny element. It's called an interstitial element, meaning it's found between the iron atoms and it can diffuse very rapidly. So the carbon will equalize, but larger elements like chromium and molybdenum are substitutional elements. They replace iron atoms and they diffuse much more slowly. Therefore, the contrast and etching comes out at the end because the chromium and molybdenum have largely not diffused between the two materials. But what this means is that the heat treating behavior of the two materials is different. I estimate there is a change in carbon content of about 0.1% between the two materials. So the RWL34 loses 0.1%, the PMC27 gains 0.1%. And so the PMC27 will heat treat differently than what it shows in the curve. So the PMC27 will actually heat treat more like AEBL, which is basically PMC27 plus 0.1% carbon. So the heat treating behavior of the composite material, uh, in fact, will have very similar hardness between the two steels. And it'll heat treat very similarly to RWL34 on its own. So I have a chart here showing damasteel with no cryo and also with damasteel with cryo. And those are my measurements. And then also a comparison with the RWL34 and PMC27 hardness values from damasteel's charts. And you can see that the combined material heat treats almost identically to RWL34. Another thing to note on this chart is maximum temperatures to use. So earlier I mentioned to stick with 1925 Fahrenheit if not using cryo. That's because we got the peak hardness at 1925. And then if we go to higher temperatures, the hardness drops. The hardness is dropping because not all of the austenite is converting to hard martensite when you quench. And that retained austenite is soft and makes the steel behave as if it's even softer than those hardness values indicate. You can also see that the hardness peaks around 2000 degrees and it might drop slightly at 2025. So a safe temperature to max out on would be about 2000 degrees, maybe slightly higher. Uh, and this behavior is similar to what is observed for ATS-34 and RWL-34. So here's a chart for no cryo from Hitachi with ATS-34 and Latrobe with 14.4 uh, chrome moly, the same steel. And both of them show hardness peaking around 1925 Fahrenheit. And in my own experiments of AEBL, I also found the hardness to peak around 1925 with no cryo and around 1975, 2000 with cryo. So these materials are very compatible in heat treatment and they behave very similarly. So 1925 without cryo and around 1975, 2000 with cryo would be my recommendation and ignore what the Damasteel data sheet shows for PMC 27. It's not really relevant to the heat treatment here. And I also have a chart for those knife makers that wanna work with Damasteel 
uh, we have no cryo for 1925 and 1900 and then with cryo for 1950 through 2000. So you can get a nice range of hardness with a 300 to 400 degree temper between about 59 Rockwell and as high as 64, 65 Rockwell. So it can have a good range of hardness depending on the application. Now we showed the edge retention of Damasteel in the prior Damascus video that we put out where the Damasteel did very well, similar to mid-tier wear resistant steels like CPM3V or CPM154. It also did basically identical to our AEBL-154CM combination, which is two very similar steels combined together. One oddity, however, is that we had found that ladder patterning led to an improvement in edge retention, presumably from the wavy edge that it creates of the pattern, where the layers are crisscrossing the edge. However, the Damasteel ladder pattern called Hugen, I'm sure that's a perfect Swedish pronunciation, it has flattened layers as it approaches the edges of the material. You can see it's the same on the spine as it is at the edge. So this isn't from the grinding that's changing the pattern, it's because of the construction of the layers. So it was interesting that these flat layers still had the same edge retention as our ladder patterned AEBL 154CM. Because when we did compare random straight layers to ladder patterning on other materials like Apex Ultra and L6 Damascus, there was a significant difference between straight layers and wavy layers in a ladder pattern. So one thing we wanted to test is if this would be different if the layers of the Damasteel were actually crisscrossing the edge. So we used a different pattern called dense twist, which like it sounds, they literally twist the bar and then forge it flat again. So we tested this for edge retention and it was very similar to the Hugen. It might have been a little bit better, but this is probably within the noise of the test. So again, the Damasteel twist did very well, similar to the ladder patterned AEBL 154CM and the Damasteel Hugen, maybe a little bit better. And so why would it be doing just as well, the Hugen, the ladder pattern material, if it's not having these crisscrossing layers along the edge? Well, I think it may actually be from the microstructure, which is in this wavy pattern crisscrossing the edge instead. Because as I also discussed, in that video, there's carbide banding and other elongated features from hot rolling, which when you do the ladder patterning will then crisscross the edge. So this may be giving the improved edge retention rather than the layers themselves. However, if we were to explain why the twist was slightly better than the Hugen, maybe it is because we do have crisscrossing layers in combination with the crisscrossing microstructure along the edge. So that was interesting. Uh, we could test this hypothesis by doing ladder patterning on a single steel. So instead of Damascus, take just 154CM or something, do a ladder patterning on it and see if the edge retention is improved from non-ladder patterned 154CM. However, we did sort of do this experiment already. So in that previous video, we talked about different layer counts of the AEBL 154CM. We did 25, 125, 625, and 3,125 layers, and we tested those for toughness and for edge retention. And for edge retention, we found that there was no difference uh, regardless of the layer count. So we would expect if the crisscrossing layers were to affect the edge retention, that if we have a high or low layer count, this should affect the behavior, but instead it was completely flat with layer count. Another thing to point out is when we look at the microstructure, there's not even obvious layers anymore. And this is not just because the layers are so small in the 3000 layer material, but also the smaller the layers get, the shorter the diffusion distance is. And the chromium and molybdenum, not just the carbon, will equalize between the two materials and make a mono material, a single composition steel. So I think this is showing that the ladder patterning is primarily a microstructure effect and not necessarily a layer effect. And thanks to comparing Damasteel Twist and Hugen, 
we were able to see this effect. Maybe we'll be able to do in the future this test I proposed of ladder patterning a single steel. It could be fun. Before I get to the toughness of Damasteel, I should thank my Patreon supporters. Uh, we could not afford this Damasteel or these experiments without your support. If you want to support Knife Steel Nerds and Knife Steel Research, please go to patreon.com slash knifesteelnerds. Also, like and subscribe. Those are good things I hear. And uh, go buy my books. So let's get back to the toughness testing. Oh, we also measured the toughness of the Damasteel material. I did a low or medium hardness heat treatment and a high hardness heat treatment to see how it changes with hardness. And the dense twist came out about a point softer than the Hugen did. Uh, but the most odd thing was that the dense twist had a big spread in results where the Hugen was very consistent. And we were very confused by this, so we made four more coupons and retested. And this time, the properties were in a much smaller distribution, as we would expect. So I don't know what led to the difference. It looks like basically the Hugen and Twist pattern tested similarly if you compensate for hardness, since the Dense Twist was slightly softer. It might be that the dense twist is slightly tougher than the Hugen pattern. Maybe if we propose that the crack uh, growth direction has to go through the layers, you know, the layers are at like this sort of 45 degree angle. Maybe that is leading to slightly better toughness that has to break across the layers. But that's mostly conjecture, and that could just be noise in the data again, just like we discussed with the edge retention earlier. Now, if we compare the Damasteel performance against the two separate materials, so here I have RWL34 and CPM154, and then I have AEBL, which is our stand-in for 12C27. The Damasteel is testing much closer to the RWL34 than it is to the AEBL, and this was similar to other Damascus deals that we tested in that other video, where it seemed like the toughness was primarily being controlled by the less tough of the two materials, and that there's not much of a benefit of having a tougher material in the Damascus, at least in this orientation of testing. Maybe in other specific toughness tests, you would see a difference. Okay, to summarize, we learned lots of things. The Damasteel DS93X is a high quality powder metallurgy stainless Damascus product. It's made up of RWL34 and PMC27. Those are powder metallurgy versions of ATS34 and 12C27. Oh, they tested great in our testing. We had good toughness, good edge retention. There were a few, couple issues with the data sheet that we discussed. Uh, I recommend you follow you know, a 1925 max austenitizing temperature, that's 1050C, if you're not using cryo after the quench. If you are using cryo, you can austenitize as high as about 2000 degrees. Temper between 300 degrees Fahrenheit, about 150 Celsius. And I didn't test any higher than 400 degrees Fahrenheit to see when tempered martensite embrittlement might happen. You can probably temper higher than 400, but 400 degrees, which is about 200 degrees Celsius, is a good safe maximum temperature to temper to. Uh, the edge retention was good. We saw maybe slightly better with the dense twist, perhaps from those layers crisscrossing the edge. We also showed that ladder patterning might not be an improvement in edge retention because of the layers or at least not primarily so, but it seems to be a microstructure effect. And we also showed that for toughness, the dense twist and Hugen were very similar. Maybe the dense twist was slightly better, but again, it's hard to tell in the noise of the test. If it's a small improvement, it may not be real, as with any type of testing. So anyway, this was fun to look at. I really enjoyed studying this Damasteel material. So thanks everybody for watching. Until next time.